Welcome to Personal Unlock. Audiobooks read to you completely for free. This is the One Sentence Persuasion Course by Blair Warren. Introduction The world has changed, and not necessarily for the better. Surrounded by chaos, confusion, and fear, most of us are wondering how we're going to survive, not only as individuals, but also as a world. I wish I had an answer, but I don't. I don't even know if there is an answer. But I do know this, those who are most likely to survive in today's world of mass corruption, deceit and delusion, are those who learn to see, truly see, for themselves, acknowledge the reality of what they see, and strive to live as if the things they know to be true are true. Easier said than done. Even if one does manage to wake up, the allure of our cultural trances, coupled with a never-ending deluge of distractions, virtually guarantees we will not stay awake for long. So, whatever can be done must be done in those brief moments in which we find ourselves awake. And for me, that means taking whatever wisdom makes itself known to me and capturing it, to the best of my ability, so that I might return to it during darker times and use it to pull myself up, dust myself off, and not only survive, but perhaps, even succeed. I call this wisdom crooked wisdom, not because it is unethical, but because it is uncommon. And it is uncommon because it often goes against everything we have been taught, everything we have been led to believe. I do not claim the ideas you will find in my books of crooked wisdom are all universally true. But I do claim they have been invaluable to me and I believe some of them might prove invaluable to you. One cannot not influence. It is, therefore, absurd to ask how influence and manipulation can be avoided, and we are left with the inescapable responsibility of deciding for ourselves how this basic law of human communication may be obeyed in the most humane, ethical, and effective manner. Dr. Paul Watzlawick The Language of Change About this version of the OSP course I released the original version of the One Sentence Persuasion course as a free download back in 2005. Despite the fact that I barely promoted it, the original version was downloaded thousands of times. And to date, it is, by far, the most popular material I've ever created. And this, quite frankly, shocked me. When I sat back and read the report myself for the first time, I was certain it was destined for obscurity. When I saw my ideas in print, they seemed far too simplistic to be of much use or interest to anyone else. Boy, was I wrong. I heard from one man in his seventies who asked permission to teach these ideas to the entire congregation of his church. I heard from others who said it had answered lifelong questions about why we do the things we do. Others told me it had completely changed the way they thought about persuasion and influence. I even heard from one young lady who said it was the sexiest thing she'd ever read. I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but I'll take it as a compliment. In the midst of all this, some people wanted more. They wanted more examples, more strategies, more one-sentence persuasion. Still, for years I resisted the idea of expanding the original because I felt I'd already made my point. But within the last few years I've gained some additional insights and have made some new distinctions that I think add to the original material. So, in the spirit of progress and capitalism I've put together this updated and expanded version of the one-sentence persuasion course. While it isn't free like the original, hopefully it'll be worth far more than the few bucks it'll cost you to download it. How to read this book? In a moment, I'm going to present the original one-sentence persuasion course in its entirety. While I've made a few updates to the original text, it is pretty much as it was when I first released it. And, this is on purpose. You see, in a very real way I have always thought of this material as a performance, something that shouldn't be altered too much lest it lose its original power. So again, the course material will be presented in much the way it was originally. Afterwards, I will expand on the material, answer a few common questions I've received about it, and then I'll share with you a two-word persuasion strategy that just might blow your mind. But first, here's the original one-sentence persuasion course. The original one-sentence persuasion course. Warning, do not skip ahead to discover what the one sentence is. Doing so will only diminish its impact. The sentence will be revealed soon enough, so take your time and read all the way through. It will be worth the wait. I promise. 
one sentence persuasion? Is it possible to capture and communicate anything of value about persuasion in a single sentence? It is. And I'm about to prove it. But first, let me tell you why I've gone to this extreme. Studying persuasion and influence is one of my deepest passions and has consumed an embarrassingly large amount of my time and energy for over a decade. I have family and friends who say my pursuit borders on obsession. They are wrong. It crossed the line long ago. I know of no subject more fascinating, more empowering, more profitable and, unfortunately, more confusing. This confusion is more than unfortunate. It is also largely unnecessary. Given the pace of today's world, it has never been easier to be powerfully persuasive. Never. It doesn't require good looks, a silver tongue, or infallible logic. It doesn't require confidence, charisma, or a magnetic personality. It is a simple matter when one cuts through all the smoke. It's cutting though the smoke that's the hard part. In fact, if you have yet to develop your persuasive powers to the level you want, it likely has nothing to do with you. Given the shell game of strategies and misinformation available it is a wonder we are able to still understand each other, much less persuade each other. If this barrage of techno-jargon has left you more confused than empowered, take a deep breath and relax. We're about to take aim at this confusion, blow away the smoke, and make things as simple as possible. In fact, we'll nail it down to a single sentence. Just 27 words. And with these words, we can work miracles. But first, we must clear away some smoke. Set up. Before we venture into our material on persuasion, let's take a quick peek at the field of magic, for the two share a common core. Try this sometime. Visit a magic shop in your city and spend half an hour or so watching the owner demonstrate some tricks. Pick the one that baffles you the most, and buy it. Then go out to your car and open up the instructions, if you're like me, you won't be able to wait until you get home, and discover how the trick works. If you will do this, I can predict with 99.9% .9 accuracy what will happen. You will be disappointed. The secrets behind many magic tricks, even some of those that seem like miracles, are often so mundane, that one cannot help but feel disappointed upon their discovery. Now, for another prediction, your next thought will be this. This is ridiculous. This wouldn't fool anyone. At this point, if you're like most people, you'll put the trick away and consider your $20 investment a bust. But, if you're honest with yourself and few people are you will have another thought that can transform the way you look at life. No joke. That thought goes something like this. Wait a minute. It must not be that ridiculous if it fooled me. And with this one thought, you will have risen to a level of intellectual honesty and understanding that few people ever experience. You will have discovered that the most magical things in life, on and off the stage, are often the result of the correct application of the most basic principles imaginable. This is perhaps nowhere more true than in the field of persuasion. I realize this is heresy for me to say, as persuasion is clearly a complicated field. And judging from the amount of new material coming out every day, it is only going to get more so. Without a doubt, it has never been easier for us to get lost down the rabbit hole, only to be spit back out more confused and broke than when we started. Don't get me wrong. I've studied these materials for many years, and I'll be the first to tell you, there is a lot of great stuff out there. Many subtleties are available that can have a powerful impact on our ability to persuade others. Unfortunately, for every one of these, there are a dozen that only serve to complicate and confuse. The good news is one does not have to spend years studying this type of material to become an almost frighteningly powerful persuader. If you find this hard to believe, consider that charismatic leaders and hypnotic seducers have been around as long as there have been men to lead and women to seduce. If they didn't need today's cutting-edge techniques, why do you? What is necessary is a fundamental understanding of human nature. For persuasion, even the most extreme examples of persuasion, such as suicide cults and mass movements, is often based on the most basic of human desires. Just as magicians can perform miracles using mundane principles, powerful persuaders shape the world in much the same way. So we are left with the basics. The question now becomes, which basics? 
I'm sure if you ask this question of a hundred different persuasion experts, you'd get a hundred different answers. But I am also certain there would be much common ground. I am certain of this because I have seen it hiding behind the very terminologies and philosophies in their materials. When one strips away the jargon and intricacies of the material available, one is left with some very basic, very powerful understandings. And while each of U.S. might represent these in different ways, the important thing is to get a handle on them so that they are available to us at a moment's notice. I have found the best way to do this is to encapsulate them in a single sentence. Not a sentence that one delivers, but a sentence that one remembers. A sentence that can help guide your efforts from beginning to end and in virtually every situation imaginable. This sentence could easily be condensed or expanded, and after reading this report, I encourage you to try to do this for yourself. In fact, the best way to make these ideas your own is to modify them to suit your own understanding and experiences. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at this sentence, this one sentence persuasion course, and see what makes it tick. Here it is. People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. Read that again. People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. That, in a single sentence, contains five of the most important insights I have learned in all my years of studying and applying the principles of persuasion. We hope you're enjoying this audiobook so far. Before we continue, you should know that we upload one to two books like this to our YouTube channel every month. However, our exclusive VIP members get two additional audiobooks, delivered straight to their inbox, completely free, each and every month. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, join the VIP club by visiting www.personalunlock.com VIP. You'll be getting free audio books about personal development, business, marketing, and the law of attraction completely free. Once again, that's www.personalunlock.com VIP. We look forward to seeing you on the inside. Now, back to the book encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, help them throw rocks at their enemies. Now, these are not the most important because they are comprehensive. They're not. They are not the most important because they've been scientifically proven. They haven't. And they're not the most important because they're based on the latest persuasion technology. They're not. They are the most important because they are simple, they are immediately useful and they can be frighteningly powerful. Hitler used them and nearly took over the world. Cult leaders Jim Jones, David Koresh, a Marshall Applewhite used them and commanded such loyalty that many of their followers willingly, even eagerly, died for them. And yet, these five insights are not only tools for mad men, but for marketers, salesmen, seducers, evangelists, entertainers, etc. In short, they are the tools for anyone who must connect with others and, more importantly, make these connections pay off. Explanation If you don't believe me, try to find a truly successful ad campaign that does not use one or more of these five insights. Really. Try to find one. Then, when you give up on that, try to find a deep satisfying relationship that isn't built upon one or more of these ideas. Just try to find people who have a remarkable chemistry, yet fail to encourage each other's dreams. Or who demand that the other is to blame. Or fail to address each other's concerns. Or treat each other as paranoid. Or leave each other to fight their own battles. While I'm certain you could find an example if you searched hard enough, I am also certain that for every one you find, I can find a hundred to counter it. The bottom line is, whenever and wherever people form powerful bonds, these insights are more often than not, lurking in the shadows. Now, there is nothing particularly difficult to understand about these strategies. They are self-explanatory. Some may even say they're obvious. But to dismiss them upon these grounds is an enormous mistake. In fact, dismissing them is one reason they are even more powerful for those who do not. 
Think back to our trip to the magic shop and how quickly we were to dismiss the secret behind our little trick. And yet, magicians aren't so quick to dismiss. Instead, they take these simple secrets that wouldn't fool anybody and build upon them to create illusions that baffle even the most brilliant among us. It is much the same with powerful persuasion. Its effects can be so sudden, so dramatic, so life-altering, that we remain convinced there has to be something deeper, something more complex going on. More often than not, there isn't. There is simply the correct application of very basic principles by people who appreciate their power. And since the rest of us dismiss these principles as being too basic and too obvious, we flounder in complexity and minutiae that sound great on paper but fall flat in practice. But by overlooking the power of these basic principles, we do more than guarantee ourselves failure and frustration. We leave those with whom we wish to connect vulnerable to others who may fill these needs we so casually dismiss. Consider On encouraging their dreams Parents often discourage their children's dreams for their own good and attempt to steer them toward more reasonable goals. And children often accept this as normal until others come along who believe in them and encourage their dreams. When this happens, who do you think has more power? Parents? Or strangers? On justifying their failures. While millions cheer Dr. Phil as he tells people to accept responsibility for their mistakes, Millions more are looking for someone to take the responsibility off their shoulders, to tell them that they are not responsible for their lot in life. And while accepting responsibility is essential for gaining control of one's own life, assuring others they are not responsible is essential for gaining influence over theirs. One need look no further than politics to see this powerful game played at its best. On allaying their fears. When we are afraid, it is almost impossible to concentrate on anything else. And while everyone knows this, what do we do when someone else is afraid and we need to get his or her attention? That's right. We tell them not to be afraid and expect that to do the trick. Does it work? Hardly. And yet, we don't seem to notice. We go on as if we'd solve the problem and the person before us fades further and further away. But there are those who do realize this and pay special attention to our fears. They do not tell us not to be afraid. Instead, they work with us until our fear subsides. They present evidence, they offer support, they tell us stories, but they do not tell us how to feel and expect us to feel that way. When you are afraid, which type of person do you prefer to be with? I'm confirming their suspicions. One of our favorite things to say is, I knew it. There's just nothing quite like having our suspicions confirmed. When another person confirms something that we suspect, we not only feel a surge of superiority, we feel attracted to the one who helped us make that surge come about. Hitler confirmed the suspicions of many Germans about the cause of their troubles and drew them further into his power by doing so. Cults often confirm the suspicions of prospective members by telling them that their families are out to sabotage them. It is a simple thing to confirm the suspicions of those who are desperate to believe them. And finally, on helping them throw rocks at their enemies. Nothing bonds like having a common enemy. I realize how ugly this sounds, and yet, it is true just the same. Those who understand this can utilize this. Those who don't understand it, or worse, understand but refuse to address it, are throwing away one of the most effective ways of connecting with others. No matter what you may think of this, rest assured that people have enemies. All people. It has been said that everyone you meet is engaged in a great struggle. The thing they are struggling with is their enemy. Whether it is another individual, a group, an illness, a setback, a rival philosophy or religion, or what have you, when one is engaged in a struggle, one is looking for others to join him. Those who do become more than friends, they become partners. The fact is, while these insights seem like common sense, they are anything but common practice. Except among master persuaders. What's missing? Now, there is something else worth noting about this sentence. It is missing something most people think is very important in the persuasion process. Read the sentence again and see if you can tell what it is missing. People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. 
Any ideas? If so, you're one step ahead of the game. Here's what's missing, you. There isn't a word about your wants, your needs, your hopes, or your concerns. There isn't a word about your offer or proposal. There isn't a word about what you think. It is all about the other person. Again, this is heresy. People write books about how to frame your ideas, how to present yourself, how to put your best foot forward. And yet, all that people really care about is themselves. Can you imagine how much energy you will free up if you stop focusing on yourself and put your attention on other people? Can you even imagine how much more charismatic you will become when you come to be seen as one who can fulfill some of these most basic emotional needs? Think of it like this. Imagine you are sitting down with someone you hope to influence. Your proposal makes sense. Your arguments are solid. The conversation is even pleasant. But the entire time, you are looking off to the side of the person and focusing on the wall behind them. Now, how much of a connection do you think you're going to make with that person? Remember. Everything is perfect, with the exception of your focus. Your message shines. Your confidence is solid. Your proposal is a no-brainer. And yet, none of this makes the slightest bit of difference when you are looking past the other person. This is exactly what happens in a conversation when your focus is on your own goals. You are looking past the person, looking past everything that is most important to them. And you have little hope of ever being able to establish a deep connection with them. Still not convinced? Then notice what else our sentence doesn't say. It does not say people will do anything for those who educate them, do what's best for them, or even treat them fairly. It does not say people will do anything for those who are eloquent, well-dressed, and pleasant. Nor those who make the best case for their proposals, who are reasonable and who come across as intelligent. When we focus on these basic principles of human nature, these things become negligible. When we focus on these basic principles of human nature, we create relationships in which people naturally want to do things for us. This is the real secret to getting what we want. Really. It is that simple. Or, I should say, it can be that simple. Have you ever noticed that the harder you push, the more resistance you get? When you focus on what you want, people will resist. That's what people do. Politicians lie. The sun rises in the east, and people resist pressure. But one thing people rarely resist is someone trying to meet their needs. And when one's needs have been met, a bond is often forged and a natural desire to reciprocate has been created. And just how powerful is this desire? To what extremes will people go to repay the favor? This is the frightening part. But don't take my word for it. Look around and see for yourself. People willingly leave their families for cults that fulfill these needs for them. People pick up arms and kill others for those who meet their deepest needs. People leave long-term marriages and relationships for people they just met and their spouses are often left stunned. They wouldn't be if they understood the power of these needs. Like it or not, the duration of our relationships is nothing compared to the depth of our relationships. And depth is based on the fulfillment of our deepest needs not on the duration of dialogue. Notice, I haven't said you should ignore your wants. I simply said you should focus on the other person, not forget yourself. Or to be more specific, when you are with another person you want to influence, your primary focus should be on that person. Do not look past him or her by focusing on your intentions. The time to focus on your own hopes, dreams, and desires is when you are alone. This is when you should get clear on what you hope to accomplish, on what you would like to occur, in any given encounter. But once you get to this state of clarity and find yourself face to face with another, place your attention where it can have the greatest impact. Place it on the person. Don't be afraid that your wishes will go unnoticed. On the contrary, they will find a way to express themselves in your encounters, whether they arise spontaneously or the other person solicits them, they will arise naturally. And when they arise naturally, they are often fulfilled effortlessly. Examples As I said earlier, there is nothing particularly difficult to understand about these strategies. Especially when it comes to one-on-one -on -one encounters. But, how might they be used in other situations? And, 
would they be as powerful in other situations? Let's take a look. Example 1. The Secret If there was ever a project that embraced and embodied the ideas we're discussing, it's The Secret. Though I am no fan of the film, nor the way the ideas in it are represented, there is no denying the marketing and persuasion genius that was at work in promoting and distributing this film. Whether or not you believe in the law of attraction, which is the secret referenced in the film, you can't go wrong by setting aside your personal beliefs and studying both the film and the marketing materials behind it. Entire books could be, and I suspect will be written about the persuasion and marketing strategies employed by those behind this film. But for the purpose of this book we will just look at those that speak to the concepts we're covering in one sentence persuasion. Though I will touch on each of our five concepts separately, we will soon see that there is great overlap in how these concepts are applied. But even when the ideas cannot be clearly delineated, it is easy to see them working behind the scenes. So, how does the secret encourage our dreams? How doesn't it? Virtually every message within and behind this film addresses this need. According to the film's website, this is the secret to everything the secret to unlimited joy, health, money, relationships, love, youth, everything you have ever wanted. Wow! And if your dreams go beyond material goods, no problem. In the film, Michael Beckwith tells us he has seen kidneys regenerated and cancer dissolved. We even hear from one woman in the movie who says she cured herself of breast cancer in just three months by watching funny movies on TV and by visualizing herself as being healthy. She also informs us that she did this without radiation or chemotherapy. So if you have a dream, any dream, according to the secret, you can do it. For those who buy the message, it doesn't get any more encouraging than that. In addition to encouraging our dreams, the secret goes to great lengths to help us justify our failures and confirm our suspicions. According to the original trailer for the film, a secret has been passed throughout the ages, known only to a fortunate few. Those who knew it, harnessed its power. They became the greatest people in history. Then we're told of a man who discovered and mastered the secret in 1909. Businessmen flocked to him and they paid great amounts of money for the secret. And guess what? That's right. Every one of them went on to achieve phenomenal success. But then, for some unspecified reason, they decided to keep the secret from the public forever, while they continued to reap its benefits. Eventually, the church even discovered the secret and it was banned. But now, for the first time ever, the secret is about to be released. Wow! True or not, that is some story. And not only is it tremendously entertaining, it secretly, no pun intended, lets us off the hook for our past failures. After all, how can anyone expect us to succeed if the very secret to success has been kept from us? And this same idea tends to confirm what many people suspect about getting ahead in today's world. In some way, somehow, things are rigged against the common man. There is, however, one part of the secret that does seem to speak against what I have just said. And that's this quote from the film. You are the only one who creates your reality. For no one else can think for you. No one else can do it. It is only you. Every bit of it. You. That seems to directly contradict my claim that the secret justifies our failures. It appears the secret is doing just the opposite. But is it? If you listen to the teachers in the secret, you will discover that even if you aren't aware of creating your reality, there is some unconscious part of you that is doing it. So while you are responsible, you really aren't. Some hidden part of you is. And if the part that is responsible is hidden from your awareness, how can you be held responsible for it? Now, how does the secret allay our fears? And what fears? In the context of this film, the fears that would need to be addressed are primarily fears of one being incapable of applying the secret. In other words, sure, this stuff may work for other people, but not little old me. Well, have no fear. According to the film, if you put all of your intention on the things you want, the law of attraction is going to give them to you. Every time. And, in case you're afraid there might be too much work involved, again, have no fear. As the film tells us, sometimes you will have to take action. Just sometimes. 
Even then, if you take action the way the universe wants you to, you'll feel so fantastic, you'll never want to stop. So if you're afraid of work, don't be, because it won't feel like work anyway. And finally, how does the secret help us throw rocks at our enemies? Well, according to the film, an enemy my term, not theirs, is anyone or anything that stands in the way of our getting what we want. So, how are we to deal with these enemies? We are to shun them. According to the secret, when you encounter things you don't want in your life, do not talk about them. Don't write about them. Don't join groups that worry about them. Don't push against them. Do your best to ignore them. Notice, it does not encourage you to make peace with them, to embrace them, or even to tolerate them. You are to shun them, ignore them, which, in the end, may hurt more than actually throwing rocks at them. Again, books could be written about the persuasive techniques in the making of and marketing of this film. But one thing is clear, while there are many persuasive techniques being used, even a project of this scale didn't stray from these basic principles. Example 2, Depression, Weight Loss, and Landscaping One of the most common of our five insights is justifying the failures of others. In my Forbidden Keys to Persuasion material, I refer to this as scapegoating. While the terminology is different, the underlying principle is the same. Here is an excerpt that illustrates the power of this insight. Begin excerpt. A couple of television commercials that are currently airing in the United States illustrate this point. Both of them brilliantly and ethically employ the concept of scapegoating and they do so at the very beginning of their scripts. The first commercial, for an antidepressant medication, starts out with something like, feeling depressed lately? It may be the result of a chemical imbalance in your brain. The second commercial, one for a weight loss product, starts out like this, if you've tried to lose that extra weight and have failed, it may not be your fault. It may be your metabolism. Can you see their use of the scapegoat principle? If you're depressed, it may not be your fault. It might simply be a biological factor beyond your control. And if you're overweight and have failed to slim down, it might not be your fault, but simply a problem with your metabolism. What makes the use of scapegoating in these situations ethical is that they are absolutely true statements. Depression can be caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. And obesity can be caused by metabolism. What makes the use of scapegoating brilliant in these cases is that it is used immediately in their pitches and instantly offers the viewer something of value a scapegoat for their problems. From here, the viewer is much more open to the rest of their message. A friend of mine who is a landscaper once told me that when he first meets potential clients they are often embarrassed by the condition of their property. When he senses this, he immediately points out how many of the problems with their property are due to such things as drought conditions bad soil conditions and the like. In other words, the condition of their property doesn't say anything negative about the potential client. It isn't their fault. How important is this subtle change in strategy? He told me that the number of people he secured as clients increased significantly once he realized that people often not only want their property to look nicer, but don't want to accept responsibility for it looking poor in the first place. End excerpt. Example 3, this book. If I've held your attention up to this point, there's a good reason for it. I have used the one-sentence strategy in this very book. If you read it again, you will find places where I've used our five insights sprinkled throughout. However, the best example is towards the beginning. At one point, I listed each of our five insights to not only demonstrate the effectiveness of these ideas, but also to give you a sense of how powerful and transparent they can be. Here's how I work each of these insights into that section, without raising an eyebrow. The first paragraph read, Given the pace of today's world, it has never been easier to be powerfully persuasive. Never. It doesn't require good looks, a silver tongue, or infallible logic. It doesn't require confidence, charisma, or a magnetic personality. It is a simple matter when one cuts through all the smoke. It's cutting though the smoke that's the hard part. Now, in that paragraph, I am encouraging the reader's dreams of becoming more persuasive. And, for those who have doubts about their own potential, for example, not enough confidence or charisma, I take extra steps to assure them they can do it as well. The next paragraph read, 
In fact, if you have yet to develop your persuasive powers to the level you want, it likely has nothing to do with you. Given the shell game of strategies and misinformation available it is a wonder we are able to still understand each other, much less persuade each other. In that paragraph I address two of our insights. First, I justify the failure of readers for not already being persuasive enough. Second, I confirm their suspicions that much of the material out there is too complex and confusing for anyone to understand. In the final paragraph read, If this barrage of techno-jargon has left you more confused than empowered, take a deep breath and relax. We're about to take aim at this confusion, blow away the smoke, and make things as simple as possible. In fact, we'll nail it down to a single sentence. Just 27 words. And with these words, we can work miracles. But first, we must clear away some smoke. Here, I help allay their fears with the phrase, take a deep breath and relax. Then, I help them throw rocks at their enemies with the phrase, we're about to take aim. Also, notice my use of the term we. I said, we're about to take aim. Not, I'm about to take aim. I then said, we must clear away some smoke. Not, I must clear away some smoke. These subtle changes in language help assure people that I am on their side, and no one else's. There are two important lessons to take away from this example. First, as I said before, these insights were seamlessly integrated into this material. They do not stand out as being too obvious or too simple because they aren't. In fact, since they don't stand out, they are all the more powerful. And second, my use of these insights is authentic. I didn't have to fabricate these statements to make them fit this strategy. Yes, I phrased them as I did with our insights in mind, but they remain grounded in truth, which is essential if we are to avoid getting our way but hating ourselves in the morning. The three examples above illustrate how widespread and applicable these insights really are. While most people like to think they're too wise to fall for such tactics, this very thinking makes people just that much more susceptible. One need only consider how successful these types of approaches are to confirm this. Now what? Well, Nietzsche reportedly said that the message of most books could be reduced to a single paragraph without losing anything of value. In this material I have attempted to go one better, I have attempted to create an entire persuasion course in a single sentence. I will be the first to admit that by doing this I have, in fact, left out many things that could be of value to the would-be persuader. But, as I said at the outset, if there is one thing I know to be true, it is that the most magical things in life on and off the stage are often the result of the correct application of the most basic principles imaginable. And I have found few principles that are more basic and more powerful than those offered in this one sentence. People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions and help them throw rocks at their enemies. So my goal in this course wasn't to give you a comprehensive plan to follow. It was to simplify a process that is often needlessly complex. It was to clear away cumbersome techniques and strategies that often serve to separate more than to persuade. And ultimately, it was to provide some core concepts you can use to build relationships that are not only powerful, but also profitable. Whether you find this notion distasteful or not, there is one thing you can count on, your family, friends, customers, clients, and even everyone you have yet to meet will have these needs met by someone. The only question is, will it be by you? More one-sentence persuasion. Well, that's it. The one-sentence persuasion course. And until now, that is all I've said on the subject. But as I said earlier, I've discovered a few more tricks and a few more distinctions since I wrote the original material. And now, I'm about to share them with you. A common question I'm asked is, where did I come up with the five points that make up my one sentence? Good question. I can't say I came up with them anywhere specifically, other than from the whole of my life experience. Emerson said, to believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart, is true for all men, that is genius. Now, I can't vouch for the genius part, but I can say that I have found the five points in the one sentence to be true in my life. The most important people in my life, the people who have the greatest persuasive power over me, are those who meet some or all of these needs for me. 
and if the five points also strike home with you, as they have with thousands of others, perhaps Emerson was right. Which is good news for those of us who want to go out into the world and put our mark on it. Another common question is, exactly how do we apply these five things in our lives? Well, the bad news is, there is no exact way to apply them. The good news is, there is no exact way to apply them. Persuasion may be a science, but persuasion comes wrapped in human communication, which is not a science. Nor, an art. But more like a game, which we make up as we go along. And, the five points of one sentence persuasion can serve as strategic guides to help us decide which way to play our hand at any given time. Another important thing to point out is that the five points are independent of each other. That is, it isn't necessary to address all five points, in order, or even at any one time, to exert great influence over another person. Henry Ward Beecher said, All men are tempted. There is no man that lives that can't be broken down, provided it is the right temptation put in the right spot. And while that's true, it is also true that the right spot is a moving target, and sometimes, it travels alone. That is, a person can be obsessed with his suspicions one day, and be out for revenge the next. The persuader who does not recognize this shift will soon be looking for another target because the first one will have left the building. Earlier I mentioned a two-word persuasion strategy, one that could very well blow your mind. I know, because its ramifications have blown mine. If I had to boil down the strategy behind one sentence persuasion even more than I already have, it would be this. Validate and fascinate. While neither of these two words appear anywhere in the original one-sentence persuasion course, I believe they underlie the very essence of this material. Our need for validation is so strong, yet so often overlooked, it is frightening. In my book, The Forbidden Keys to Persuasion, I put it this way. Begin excerpt. Would you walk into someone else's place of worship, change everything around and tell them how you think they should worship and expect them to thank you for it? Of course not. All of us recognize the importance a person's religious beliefs and practices play in his or her life and know better than to ridicule or criticize them if we expect to retain the person's favor. However, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, we often act in just such destructive ways whenever we make someone else wrong. Why does this have such a destructive effect on our relationships? Because one of the most important abilities people must have, and must know they have, is the ability to effectively discern reality. Like some of our other addictions, this issue goes back to our survival instinct. How can we expect to survive in our world if we can't effectively understand it? So being told that we are wrong about an issue often becomes far more important than the situation actually calls for because once again our sense of stability is threatened. End excerpt. The point is, our need for validation is no joke and it is not something we're going to outgrow. It is something we must accept and adjust for. Or, pay an awful price for not doing so. This need to be right often overtakes our desire to be well thought of, and even our desire to be treated well. This may help explain why some people are seemingly inexplicably drawn to people who treat them like crap. If we secretly feel unworthy, we will unconsciously be drawn to those who will confirm this fact for us, even though we will outwardly complain about it. We will dismiss people who try to praise us while fawning over those who denigrate us. Again, it isn't that we enjoy feeling like crap. It's that we enjoy feeling as if we have the world figured out. In his book, Resilient Identities, Dr. William Swan, Jr. says, Our self-views lie at the center of our psychological universe providing the context for all our knowledge. Should our self-views flounder, we would no longer have a secure basis for understanding and responding to the world. No wonder we protect our self-views as if our lives depended on them. Because in a very real way, they do. Okay. We now understand our need for validation, but what about our need for fascination? Better still, how can we become more fascinating to others? In the Forbidden Keys to Persuasion I refer to this need for fascination as attention capture or mental engagement. And I describe the importance of it like this. Every moment of every day, we want to be engaged in something. It often doesn't matter what it is as long as it can gain and maintain our attention. We seek entertainment, conversation, confrontation. 
We do crossword puzzles, work in the garden, listen to music. We cook, we clean, we rearrange. Even when we're exhausted and want to relax, we simply engage in something else. We swim, we go to amusement parks and we meditate. All this in an effort to alleviate the one thing few people can endure, boredom. The need for mental engagement is so fundamental that few give it much thought. But it's always there, lurking just behind our awareness, looking for something to lock onto. This is why many of us are so easily distracted. Unless our current thoughts or activities are sufficiently engaging, the next best thing that comes along will pull us away. And since it's through engagement that we experience and through experience that we are changed, those who engage us hold the keys to our hearts and minds, and from there, our actions. We do not see these people as manipulators. We see them as saviors. What holds attention determines action. William James While some view capturing attention as the first stage of persuasion, many of those I studied seem to view it as the only stage of persuasion. The fact is, there isn't a single principle of persuasion you can't violate and still succeed if you sufficiently engage in others' mind. No matter how unskilled or unpolished you may be, if you can capture and hold another person's attention long enough, they will eventually fold to your command. Why? Because when our attention is captured, our conscious judgment and self-awareness recedes and suggestibility takes their place. End excerpt. Now that we understand the importance of fascination in the persuasion process, how do we do it? Simple. And I'm about to prove it. But first I want to introduce you to another two-word persuasion strategy. This is one that most people are using and they're using it unconsciously and it's destroying their ability to influence others. As powerful as the two-word strategy validate and fascinate is, the next strategy is even more powerful. But in a negative way. This two-word strategy is correct and convince. This strategy is so common, so entrenched, and so widespread, that we don't even tend to recognize it. Yet, it is all around us, all the time. And worse, it is often coming out of us all the time as well. If we insist on correcting people before we convince them, we might as well accept the fact that we're never likely to convince them of anything. In fact, the attempt to correct other people often makes their current ways of thinking even more entrenched. So if the correct and convince strategy is so useless, why is it so widespread? One reason may be that most people don't think they could apply something like the validate and fascinate strategy. After all, while it is one thing to be able to validate others, the ability to fascinate them is something else entirely. Right? Wrong. Despite what we've been taught, fascinating others is one of the easiest things in the world, if you do it within a context of validation. Thus, the strategy validate and fascinate. In that order. Now compare this with the correct and convinced strategy. Within a context of correction, nothing we say will be very convincing. So, which strategy do you use most often? And which strategy do you think you'll use more often after reading this book? I thought so. And of course, I think you're entirely justified in doing so. Fascinating, huh? I want to close by touching on a very important point. I want to acknowledge that there will be times that we can't in good conscience validate these needs for others. Sometimes, we may not be able to bring ourselves to encourage another's dreams. Especially if we feel the dreams are particularly harmful to them. Or, are very unlikely to happen for them. Sometimes we may need to encourage others to accept full responsibility for their actions. To do otherwise might promote irresponsible behavior. Sometimes we cannot allay another's fears because that person might be, in fact, justifiably afraid. Sometimes we may not be able to confirm another's suspicions because their suspicions are just plain wrong. And finally, we may not be able to help them throw rocks at their enemies because they have misidentified the enemy. We will occasionally find ourselves in situations like these. And we'd be wise to prepare for them in advance. So, what do we do when we find ourselves in such situations? Easy. Instead of validating the specific needs they're trying to fulfill, we can address and validate the more universal needs and motives underlying them. 
For example, if we can't encourage a specific dream a person may have, we can certainly acknowledge the importance of having such dreams, and then attempt to move them in a more positive direction. If we can't justify their failures, we can at least acknowledge that there are many contributing factors to any situation and then suggest that, right or wrong, sometimes the most effective way to get out of a situation is to act as if one is completely responsible for it. If we can't allay their fears, we can at least assure them that it is okay to be afraid. To tell someone who is already afraid that they shouldn't be afraid only compounds the problem. If we can't confirm their suspicions, we can at least acknowledge the possibility of their suspicions being correct and let them know that we understand how they could have come to such a conclusion, even if we don't share that conclusion ourselves. If we can't help them throw rocks at their enemies, we can at least acknowledge the universal desire to seek revenge before we try to talk them out of it. In short, just because we may not agree with others, it doesn't follow that we can't validate them. But if this type of situation still bothers you, consider this. Perhaps the greatest irony of all when it comes to validating these needs is that when we are allowed to have these needs and even indulge them, we often don't. The very fact that it is okay for us to feel a certain way encourages us to stop fighting to maintain and justify our feeling that way. When we're told it is okay to dream, we tend to be more flexible with our dreams. When we're told we're not responsible for something, we often find that we're more open to accepting responsibility for it. When we're told that it's okay to be afraid, we often feel less afraid. When we're told that we're probably justified in being suspicious, we tend to become less so. And when we're allowed to throw rocks at our enemies, we often tire of it very, very quickly. Now I can't guarantee that validating others will always allow us to get what we want from others, but I can guarantee you this, your odds are far, far better than if you set out to, or even inadvertently, belittle them. Well, there you have it. The updated and expanded version of the one-sentence persuasion course. In an all-new two-word persuasion strategy. How will you use this information? What dreams of your own will you achieve and what influence will you now exert over others? However you choose to answer those questions, I sincerely hope this information gives you the edge you need to make it happen. This information has transformed my life and I'm convinced that, if you let it, it can transform yours.